so thanks very much for the introduction and uh, for the invitation. And uh, uh, well, I, I did one of my postdocs here at Max Planck, so it was a very nice time. Well, uh, long, long before Hausdorff Center was was here, and it's very nice to see that. Uh, Born is becoming more, well, it was always uh, played a very important role in European mathematics. It's nice to see that it's becoming more and more important and there are more and more activities. So it's, it's, it's a very good thing and I hope it will continue like that. Uh, so uh, I will speak uh, about uh, uh, some approaches to the study of the Ising model and uh, maybe I'll start, uh, so I... I I will speak about some new results and uh, also have an introductory part so you can view this as a two talks merged, one colloquium style and uh, another seminar style and it's also actually literally merged because my tech broken down so I had to cut, cut and paste in Adobe Acrobat while on the airplane. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, so Ising model uh, is uh, one of the most famous models of statistical physics and it's like was mentioned in the previous talk is when you have a system which has a large number of uh, parts, like a glass of water has uh, millions of millions of millions of millions uh, yeah, uh, of uh, molecules of water and um, uh, almost. Uh, and uh, <laughs> you can either try to write uh, this uh, 10 to the 23 times uh, six numbers of equations, uh, uh, or you can try to sort of average it out, hence the word statistical, and see how it works. And there are obviously like many phenomena like that. You observe in nature that there is one simple mechanism at a molecular scale, and you observe something different at a macro scale. So here, for example, there is a picture of a, of a polymer molecule under under a microscope, so it's kind of some interesting fractal shape. Uh, or uh, on the left there is a computer model of erosion, so we start with a straight shape or round shape and then you get some fractal thing. So those are uh, two related fractals there in the same actually universality class as the high temperature expansion, uh, the, hi uh, the high temperature phase of the Ising model. Uh, so the Ising model is maybe uh, one of the, well, alo along with the random walk on Brown in motion, one of the sort of ubiquitous models uh, which started as a model of ferromagnet, but since then it has been used for many phenomena from biology and uh, IT to obviously physics and chemistry. Uh, so the <coughs> it was suggested by Lenz as a PhD topic to his student Ising, and uh, maybe more correctly it should be called Lenz Ising model, but historically somehow people start calling it Ising at one point. Uh, so uh, you take, you can study it on any graph. Usually you do some graphs in Euclidean space, so you think of a three-dimensional crystal on this picture because the screen is two-dimensional. I made a picture of two-dimensional crystal and uh, you sort of oversimplify the real situation, so you think that uh, uh, these squares, they represent uh, individual depots which can be in two positions, blue or red, and then they, uh, there is an interaction, but only among nearby depots, so each pair tries to be of the same color. So whenever you see a pair of uh, different color, so I was told that I better show with a, with a pointer here. So for example, here is red and blue. Uh, so for each pair like that, uh, you put a factor x, so some penalty x is smaller than one normally. Uh, and uh, then uh, weight of a configuration is just a product of this factor, so it's x uh, to the power number of uh, red-blue pairs of nearby atoms um, and partition function is just sum of these weights and probability of given configuration is its weight over the sum of all weights. So it's, it's very simple. X plays roles of temperature, or well, strictly speaking it's, it's a logarithm of reciprocal of the temperature. Uh, and uh, usually uh, people don't speak about colors but they speak about plus and minus spins. Uh, so they write uh, uh, then you can write uh, like in, in this form or that uh, you put instead of x uh, exponent of a product of two spins. So if the spins are the same, it's exponent of plus, uh, plus one. If the spins are different, it's exponent of minus one. So instead of possible weights x and one, you get exponent of minus beta, exponent of plus beta. So it's just a different reformulation. 
And also one can put the model in external magnetic field, which favors one color over the other, but essentially all the phenomena which you can observe already without the magnetic field and properties in the magnetic field you can deduce without. So uh, why the name of uh, Ising is attached to this is that in his thesis he proved uh, that it's a poor model in dimension one. The dimension one you don't uh, see phase transition. So what uh, Lenz, uh, his advisor, expected is that uh, in this model you would observe effects of temperature that uh, if you have high temperatures, though that corresponds to x equal 1 is high temperature, then you don't penalize for different colors, though you, sh you would see essentially a random color, like a, a sort of low old analog TV with this picture which is blurred uh, black and white dots. On the other hand, when x is equal to 0, you penalize uh, immediately by factor 0 for every difference, so everything will be exactly of the same color. So he expected that there will be a phase transition that uh, between this ordered regime and chaotic regime, and uh, what is improved essentially that for uh, every non-zero temperature you would have complete chaos. And it's, it's very easy calculation of a partition function in this case, uh, because partition function, uh, you just go left to right, and uh, each step you uh, can either multiply by y or multiply by x, uh, depending on whether you change the color or not. Uh, and in the end, just if you have n plus 1 uh, length uh, string, you get 1 plus x to the power n. And it's also very easy to uh, get out of these uh, terms which correspond to uh, chains which have the same uh, sign on two ends, uh, because it's just the even powers. And when you get it, you get that it's uh, 1 half plus something exponentially small. Uh, so if you, for example, magnetize this one-dimensional chain to one end, it exponentially fast forgets what you did, whatever, whatever x you have, uh, which is non-zero. Uh, so uh, it was thought for a while that the model breaks in all the dimensions and other models were proposed, but essentially it is correct and uh, the uh, phase transition was shown by Rudolf Pyrus and uh, it's a very nice geometric argument which would work in any dimension, he did it in dimension two. Uh, and uh, what he essentially does, uh, he uh, realize that it's important to introduce uh, geometric uh, <coughs> considerations and look at the so-called domain walls, the boundaries between uh, plus and minus spins. So, uh, a priori, they don't uh, really have direct physical meaning. If you study the model physically, you would want to see what is the average spin or correlation between different areas. So, there is no immediate use for this geometry. But apparently it can be sometimes things which don't seem to have immediate physical meaning. Uh, they, uh, they can be used to prove things. Uh, so what uh, he observed is that if we do the same thing as for the string, so we take a big square, so in this case it's square 11 by 9, uh, and uh, you magnetize its boundary, so we condition the boundary to be red, and you ask how it influences the color of the middle. If the color of the middle is blue, then there is at least one domain wall which completely surrounds this center. Actually, there will be an odd number of domain walls, but at least one there is. And what you can do, you can take the smallest one and change the colors inside this domain wall, and you get the picture on the right. And it's clear, uh, it's, it's difficult to see what are the weights of these two pictures, but the relative weight, the difference in weights, is x to the power perimeter of, 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 this, of this loop. So it's clear that the picture on the left uh, has much smaller probability than the picture on the right uh, when x is small uh, and uh, so you get small probability of having blue if not for one catch that there can be different pictures on the left which are mapped to the same picture on the right you can uh, for example you can invert not not inside this loop but inside one by one loop so we have also to carefully count how many loops you can draw but with some easy counting, you get that when x is smaller than 1 over x, uh, then probability of having blue is more than 1 over 9. Uh, so it means that uh, you have some ordered phase when temperature is small. On the other hand, it's easy to see that there is chaotic phase when x is close to 1. So it implies that there is a phase transition. And the same argument works in any dimension, but uh, what then happened uh, was a, a breakthrough uh, <coughs> uh, for dimension 2. Uh, which allowed to describe this uh, phase transition much more, with much more detail. So what I mean by phase transition is that uh, you don't move from chaos to order continuously. Rather, you jump at one given point, very much like in the real world. So if you, 
like take a piece of iron to be a magnet to it, and if you hit it, it is a perfect magnet till it hits 1043 degrees uh, Kelvin grade, and then it's, it's completely chaotic. Or a glass of water, you boil it, it hits 100 degrees Celsius, and then it's, it's uh, in the gas phase. Uh, so here it's similar. Uh, so uh, basically there is a critical temperature X. If you do a lattice model, it depends on the lattice. Uh, but otherwise, the behavior is universal. So what you get is that uh, here are, there are three uh, computer simulations side by side, and I've chosen the uh, <coughs> boundary conditions to be, uh, oops, uh, to be uh, uh, red below the equator and blue above the equator, which generates, besides some loops, it generates also one domain well which runs left to right. Uh, so if uh, temperature is small, you penalize uh, for the length of domain walls a lot. So they try to be very short. So there are very, very few loops, and there is one domain wall which is almost straight. On the other hand, if temperature is high, so for example, if x is equal to 1, you don't penalize at all. So you just see a disordered picture like here, so you don't even see where this, so there are many loops, and there is one domain wall which goes left to right, but you don't even see it. It's, it's very, very chaotic. And Basically, what happens, there is a one number X critical, so that above X critical for large boxes, you see this picture. Below X critical, you see ordered picture. And at X critical, you see a special chaos, which is sort of in between. And, uh, uh, well, a bit running a bit fast. What you expect is that, uh, well, maybe, 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 maybe I'll say, well, say, 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 say it later. So, uh, Lars Schanzager, who was a famous chemist, but also made quite some uh, contributions to uh, physics and mathematics. Uh, he, uh, following uh, first work Kramers and Vanier, who determined the critical temperature, he uh, derived partition function, uh, asymptotic forms of partition function, magnetization in the easing model, etc., etc. Uh, and that op opened uh, sort of Pandora's box of exact uh, calculations for the easing model. So many people got involved. It's impossible to list on one slide even people who uh, did something during the first 15 years, and there are many, many different methods. So at the time, it was kind of a shock because uh, you know that there is a phase transition, which means that there are non-analytic parameters. So, so you you would you would have in chaotic phase zero magnetization, and afterwards you will have non-zero. So it's a, and then if you prove something, how can you prove uh, how you derive exactly a function which is not analytic? But what can happen? Like any non-analytic function, you can approximate by say by polynomials. So what you can do, you derive some analytical results, you show that for box n by n, it's always all the parameters are polynomials, which are polynomials of order n squared, uh, or exponent of n squared. Uh, and then, then you show that they tend to something non-analytic. Only it sort of requires uh, more work. And um, many methods uh, were used, not, not always rigorous, uh, uh, and it's sometimes it's very difficult to, and physicists and mathematicians have different viewpoints on what is rigorous, what is not, but some, some are. And uh, what uh, arrived late, it was uh, put into two larger uh, frameworks, framework of renormalization group and framework of conformal field theory uh, for dimension two. Uh, so I, I would just say, maybe show two pictures for, for these things. So renormalization group, uh, so Wilson got, uh, Ken Wilson got a Nobel Prize for this. It was originally introduced by Petterman and Stuckelberg. So what you do, uh, you start killing degrees of freedom in your model. So for example, you can decide that you play uh, democracy with the model. You separate spins in, say, four by four blocks, like on this picture, and each four by four block uh, has a vote. Uh, and majority wins, and then there is one representative spin which is chosen. So you change the mesh of the lattice instead of uh, mesh becomes four times smaller. Uh, and obviously you lose some information, so it's not exactly the easing model you get, you forget. But you can argue that it's approximately the easing model and uh, the only the temperature has changed. So uh, what you get is that if you uh, draw a very big space of all the easing models on all possible lattices and uh, their variations in the continuum at different temperature, you can argue that there are these renormalization transformations like this one uh, where you uh, redo everything uh, by a factor of 4 by 4, which also change uh, the temperature. And you have uh, this huge uh, uh, space, uh, so there will be these flow lines for, uh, for different uh, renormalizations. 
And this uh, Curie point where you have phase transition, it arises as a fixed point of this renormalization. And also other regimes, they also have fixed points. So, for example, uh, here in two dimensions, if you really restrict it to the temperature, if you try to, you can't literally do this, but if you project on the temperature line, there will be uh, three fixed points. One is the trivial fixed point, zero temperature, where everything is frozen. And everything uh, below the critical temperature is attracted to it exponentially fast. So this is actually a fixed point which uh, we understand very well. There is a theorem of Pfister and Villenik which says, uh, for example, that on that picture this thing will, will try to be a straight line and it will look like a graph of a random walk. So if the size of box is n, graph of uh, random walk uh, will deviate by square root of n. So in the scaling limit is just a straight line. So there is a very precise analysis. And now uh, there is this high temperature chaotic phase, and uh, here it would, uh, well, it tends to percolation regime, only we don't know how to prove it yet. Uh, uh, so, uh, so this is a regime where you uh, forget everything about correlation of spin, so this is a model of magnetism, it uh, stops making sense and seems trivial, but you can do connection probabilities and study domain woes, and actually, uh, from this picture, you don't see what is the domain wall, and it's not a space filling curve. Actually, it splits in many domain walls, uh, which are loops, uh, and which are fractal loops of dimension seven quarters, and which touch each other and themselves. Uh, but uh, it's just I, I will show a similar picture later. But this we, c we don't know. This we know only on uh, triangular lattice and at infinite temperature, but otherwise we don't know, and that would be a big thing to know it mathematically, but we are 100% sure. And then there is another uh, regime at criticality where, again, uh, you have these sort of fractal loops, only they are more visible here. They have uh, dimension 11 over 8, and they are almost surely in the scaling limit simple curves. And uh, uh, again, uh, it's, it's, it's a nice regime, only it's uh, uh, harder to attain this point because it's very unstable. So it's, it's, it's like in real life, it's hard to keep water, it's exactly 100 degrees. Either it's water or it's gas, but in this intermediate regime, it's hard to see. Uh, so one of the conclusions of this uh, renormalization theory was that these Curie points, so the, the interesting points like uh, this one or this one, uh, uh, they would be universal, independent of the lattice. Uh, so it's basically like uh, liquids boil at different temperatures, but they boil all the same, and ferromagnets, they uh, have different Curie temperatures, but the exponents are the same. Uh, but uh, also, uh, it implies that they should be uh, invariant uh, under rescaling and rotation, because they are, they are universal. So, for example, why it's invariant under rescaling by a factor of four? Because it's a fixed point of rescaling by a factor of four. Uh, so it's invariant under this rescaling, but also under other group elements. And if it's not invariant under rotation, well, the lattice is not. But if the fixed point in the limit is not invariant under rotation, then it's not universal because we can rotate lattice and then we get another fixed point. So fixed point has some symmetries, and this eventually led to the introduction of conformal field theory by Bewav and Polyakov and Zemaochikov, and in this case it was first applied by Cardi to calculate some exponents. Uh, so the uh, reasoning, you need to do some uh, leap of faith, which is... Uh, might be too much uh, for mathematicians. So you say that uh, conformal transformations, the, the, that is analytical maps, uh, uh, or maps which preserve angles, uh, locally they are translations, rotations, uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, rescalings. And since our fixed point is preserved by translation, rotation, and rescaling, it should be preserved by all conformal maps. Uh, so there are, I mean, there are artificial counterexamples to, to this principle, but it works in all you know, physically reasonable situation, it works. Uh, and what is nice about conformal symmetries is that in two dimensions there are really a lot of them. So by Riemann uniformization theorem we can map, uh, well, for example, any bounded uh, simply connected domain to any other bounded simply connected domain. So we have this large pseudo group of conformal maps. Uh, so Curie point has infinite number of symmetries. And of course, object which has infinite number of symmetries is easy to characterize. It turns out that essentially there is a one parameter of family of such objects, conformal field theories, uh, or well, maybe a bit more parameters if you do some decorations, but uh, basically if you want to study a scaling limit of easing model, you should just understand which of parameter it corresponds to. It corresponds to parameter c equal to one half, uh, and, and then you can, can deduce all, all, all other things. So this is the 
kind of recapitulation of the, of the first uh, uh, 20 minutes of the talk. Uh, so what uh, is known in the physics of the easing model? So there is no phase transition in dimension one, but there is an elegant geometric proof that in dimension bigger than one there is. Now, uh, there is a renormalization theory which should apply in every dimension, and Curie point and exponents arise from it. In dimension two, furthermore, you have exact syllabil, so you can get um, some nice, uh, nice formula. I, I haven't spoken about, I haven't written those, but some will appear later. And moreover, in dimension two, there is conformal field theory with infinite group of conformal symmetries. Now, the higher dimension d, d big uh, or equal than four is, is much easier. Uh, so, and I won't speak about it. I mean, much easier uh, technical details can be sometimes really, really difficult, but it's sort of more clear how one, one should prove things. And it's actually, yeah, maybe it's, it's bad to say it's much easier in the sense that, uh, well, the general understanding for all models is that there is a critical dimension. The easiest is d equal one, then next is above critical dimension, then d equal two, and then d equal three. So sort of such order. But it means, uh, easiest on the intuitive level. You understand what you should do. Sometimes it still can take uh, like decades to do for very smart people. So there are some models where still we don't, didn't push it to, to, D, to, to exact D. And uh, D equal three is the most uh, difficult, but uh, there is an interesting thing that recently there was uh, on the physics uh, run there were advances in understanding conformal field theory and there are very good calculations with like 12 digits, uh, well, almost rigorous of all the scaling exponents, uh, bis, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, conformal field theory there, it only adds one transformation to rotation, rescaling, and translation, and that's inversion. There are no more conformal transformations in 3D, but it turns out that this already gives, gives uh, enough tools. So now I will pass more to the mathematics. Uh, and uh, again, uh, more of an expository part, so I'll... Uh, uh, there was a big mathematical progress in understanding some of the two-dimensional models. And uh, essentially, I will speak uh, more about two methods. And one is schramm lovner evolution, or it's, a way, uh, it's another way to disc uh, So I said that there is a one-parameter family of conformal field theories. So schramm lovner evolution is a way to describe this uh, one-parameter family geometrically. So in, instead of speaking of correlations of spins, you speak about scaling limits of domain walls. You speak about random curves. And uh, geometry sometimes can be better used to do estimates. And the other thing is uh, discretizations of complex analysis, the way to see that you have some conformal structure already on a lattice. Uh, so schramm alone revolution was introduced by Schramm. As I said, it's a way to um, construct random conformal invariant fractal curves. And uh, there is one parameter family of them. So the first two for which uh, they were proved that something discrete converse to them was a uniform spanning tree. So uniform spanning tree, you take some graph and then you uh, take all possible subtrees which are spanning uh, with the same weight. So here, uh, here it is a picture of uniform spanning tree for, uh, for a square like 30 by 30. And of course the curve which goes around will be space filling because it goes around a tree which passes through all vertices. So it converts to a CLE8. So a CLE8 is a random conformally invariant piano, space filling piano curve, a nice, nice, beautiful object. For percolation, so it's easing at infinite temperature, as I said, that from this uh, picture you can hardly see the, the loops, but if we do the boundary conditions as, as the Dabrushan boundary conditions, that there is one uh, domain wall which runs in this picture between two corners, you will see that there will be a domain wall which touches itself or rather passes within distance one many, many times, and it converges to a CLE6, which is a, another, another random curve. Uh, so how the schramm lovni revolution is, uh, is defined, uh, so this is a slide from Adet Schramm's uh, first talk about it. Uh, so here he does uh, percolation, but you can as well do easing model at any other temperature. So, uh, so here it's just a random coloring of a hexagonal lattice where uh, X is equal one, so we just take all co coverings to be equally likely. So we introduce boundary conditions uh, like Dabrushan boundary conditions, which uh, which is uh, half of the boundary of domain is gray, half is white, and this generates one domain wall. Uh, so which which goes off to infinity in this picture. Uh, so what uh, was the nice idea of Adet is that. Uh, he wanted to study a geometric object, which is not too complicated, not, for example, the limit of all domain walls, 
but yet which is non-trivial and uh, carries enough information. And then he said that if we believe the conformal field theory principles, uh, this curve should have a scaling limit, which is a conformally invariant random curve. And then they came up uh, with the correct uh, tool to describe it. It's uh, called Lovner evolution and was introduced by Lovner some uh, 75 years before to prove Weber-Bach's conjecture. Uh, and eventually it was used by Louis de Branche to prove Weber-Bach's conjecture. But uh, here, well, how, how it looks like. So we take uh, this curve in percolation and we start drawing it and we go, as we go, uh, it turns out that it's enough to know immediate neighborhood of your trajectory to draw this curve. If you draw a domain wall, you don't need to know what happens 10 spaces away. Just a myopic end who walks on a lattice and who only sees one uh, hexagon away, he can perfectly draw this curve. And you notice that if you draw it to some time, then essentially part of the curve looks like the boundary of the domain. So boundary of domain was black on the left, white on the right. Here it's the same, white on the right, black on the left. So the suggestion of Schramm was uh, that uh, what you do, you open this slit you get by a conformal map. And then there is a Lovner equation, so it's this very nice uh, equation, which tells you that you can reconstruct this evolution of this slit from one parameter wt, which is essentially um, analog, analog uh, it, it is one coefficient in expansion of gt, but the analog would be that if you drive your car at a constant speed and uh, you know how you rotate your steering wheel, you can solve an equation and reconstruct the trajectory. So here it's the same thing, but in conformal geometry, not in Euclidean. You drive a conformal car uh, uh, at a speed of 55 conformal miles per conformal hour, uh, and uh, then uh, if you know how you rotate your steering wheel, you can reconstruct the curve. Of course, the, there is a case that if you uh, know the trajectory of the car, it's easy to reconstruct the rotation of steering wheel, just do some differentiation, but back you need to solve an equation which turns out to be nonlinear and generally non-integrable. So basically, I know only like two or three functions which you can plug in where you can easily integrate it. So for example, if if uh, this uh, function is linear, then you get, you start driving on spirals. If it's square root of t, it's also kind of different kind of spirals. If it's constant zero, you just al drive along a green line, uh, along sort of electrostatic line. Now, if you plug in a random curve, then you get a random trajectory. And uh, Schramm uh, plug in a brown in motion and got a random trajectory, this is silly. Or actually, he proved a lemma on the other, he did the other way around. He showed that if you have a curve coming from this situation, then uh, the driving force has to be a process which is continuous, that's automatic from Lovner uh, investigations, uh, but uh, also with independent, identically distributed increments. And continuous random process with IED increments, it, it is brown in motion. So the proof of this beautiful lemma, it's, it's, it's buried in his first... 80 page paper about that. It takes only one page and basically it goes, so let me just flash the proof uh, in front of you. So you draw the slit, you stop at epsilon capacity increments, you open it up by conformal maps J epsilon. So here J epsilon, which are covered, are different realizations of J epsilon, but they are all picked up from the same space because we believe conformal invariance. So they are chosen independently. And then the map J and epsilon, uh, the composition is their combination. And if you look carefully about at, at those maps, you will see that the first and second coefficient, they are additive. And nonlinearity starts with the third and fourth coefficient and so on. So if you expand it infinity, the first coefficient is additive and the third is additive. And the third is exactly electrostatic capacity of the curve. So this is our parameterization we have chosen that at time epsilon capacity is two epsilon. And the first is this, is this driving force, the how we uh, rotate the steering wheel, and we get that driving force is just the sum of independent increments. So it has to be brown in motion. So this can be viewed as a random walk on a modular space. So in this case, it's just uh, we have like half plane and with two distinguished points, zero and infinity. So there is a trivial space, but you can do the same trick on a Riemann surface. So you can do Riemann surface with part of the boundary and like marked points, and then it will be indeed uh, even more interesting random walk on the modular space. So uh, what is uh, good about SLE is that uh, it reduces all uh, problems you have uh, to problems of stochastic calculus. So instead of studying a two-dimensional system with complicated interactions and this like kind of fractal 
domain walls, you study Brown and motion. So essentially, uh, the questions of, for example, what is the dimension of domain wall in the Ising model, it boils down to uh, some statement that you have this diffusion, bit of diffusion with Brown and motion, and what is the chances that between time 100 it will hit number 10. It's uh, very much what, uh, if you ever teach financial mathematics course, then what you solve uh, in these sort of uh, diffusion models for markets. So it's kind of equations which uh, uh, probably know very well to solve. Uh, or at least sometimes you get non-integrable PDE, so you don't uh, know how to solve. But if you know the solution beforehand, you can easily prove that it's a solution. And there are interesting theorems you can prove about it. So, for example, Hussdorf dimension of a silly is 1 plus kappa over 8. And that there are, there are different phases. It's almost surely simple curve for small kappa, and then it's self-touching, and then it's space feeling. And there are mm, less trivial ones which correspond to some few theory dualities. Now I'll say a few words about the discrete complex analysis. Uh, and um, essentially, we want to do uh, some complex analysis on some two-dimensional planar graph. So this was uh, implicit in the study of uh, random walk by Courant, Friedrichs, and Levy, and uh, by others at, at, at the beginning of the 20th century. So in the modern form, it was pioneered by Rick Kenyon for two-dimensional models like Dimers and loop erased random walk in uniform spanning tree. So basically, you have some random model on a graph, and you find some observable, it can be spin correlation probability to pass through an edge which is discrete harmonic, and that's people usually know it's, it's a classical subject, or better yet discrete analytical, discrete holomorphic. And then you can deduce uh, that in the limit, uh, this, that this observable will have a limit, the limit will be usual analytic function, and hence it will be conformally invariant, and you can deduce connection to SCLE. Now, what is discrete analytic function? Well, there is, uh, they were implicit in the work of Kirchhoff on electrical networks, so essentially, Analytic function, you can view it as a vector field which is uh, closed and co-closed, which is divergence-free and curve-free. So you can do the same thing for a vector field on, on a graph that uh, satisfies two Kirchhoff laws. So you do some, you put some arrows on the graph, put some numbers, and then ask that uh, currents coming from a vertex sum up to zero, comments, currents around an edge sum up to zero. Uh, and then this is, this is like a gradient of harmonic function, so it's, it's like an analytic function. Uh, and there, is, there was a curious application of these things so be before they made this reappearance in statistical physics, and uh, it's, it's a paper by four Cambridge undergraduates, Brooks, Smith, Stone, and Tutt, one of whom then became famous combinatorials and another famous actuary, uh, and, uh, and all of them worked on the Enigma code during the war. Uh, so uh, they observed that uh, there is a bijection between tilings of plane regions by squares and uh, uh, these electric networks with two Kirchhoff laws. So basically the proof is on this picture. So for each vertex uh, in a graph, you draw a horizontal interval. And for each edge, you draw a square of the size current through this edge between these two intervals. And then two Kirchhoff laws, they essentially say one of them says that horizontal interval can be calculated, its length can be calculated from above by two squares here and one below. Uh, and the other Kirchhoff law says the same about vertical intervals. So there is this, this nice thing. Uh, okay, so, uh, so there is this nice uh, interpretation of uh, discrete holomorphic functions. Uh, and uh, uh, in general, there is discrete conformal geometry. You can do it with uh, tilings by squares. Uh, there is another way, nonlinear, to do it with tilings by circles, which was very popular for a time. But uh, essentially, this, this all belong. I mean, you can do the whole spectrum of such things, and it uh, corresponds to some integrable hierarchies. So we prefer this square interpretation because it's linear, but it's just saying that you have some, you can say some geometrical, see some geometrical structure be behind. It's like conformal map. It uh, doesn't care about distances. It cares about angles. So it maps small circles to circles. And here we don't care about size of squares. We just care where there's a square. Squares are like uh, circles. They're the same in, in all lattice directions. OK. So what is the discrete homomorphic thing in easing? So there are um, mm, two functions which arise from uh, uh, fermions known by physicists, but uh, you have to rewrite them as a complex valued functions. Uh, so uh, I will say more about one of them, but uh, the other one can be written as a partition function of easing model with a monodromy at a point. And uh, 
what is nice that they are discrete uh, homomorphic and they are solutions to a discrete uh, Riemann-Hilbert boundary value problem and you can pass to a limit and get that the limits are homomorphic functions which solve Riemann-Hilbert boundary value problems and from that you can do connection to SLE and uh, you can deduce many other things. So for example the left uh, picture is, is the usual uh, easing at criticality uh, so uh, some weak convergence follows immediately, but then if you want to do really convergence with Hausdorff topology of curves, then it's, it's, uh, it's uh, quite some technical work. And on the right, there is another representation of uh, easing model, so-called random cluster representation. And then, like for percolation, it's, it's, it's a curve which touches itself. And uh, those are two different SLEs, which I in some way do. Uh, so let me just see what I want to do. Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe uh, how I, I will say one word about uh, this, this picture on the right, this one. Uh, so this is a, for representation of the easing uh, model, which is called random cluster representation. And it's one of these uh, things people came up uh, with in 60s and 70s. Uh, so uh, what you do, you do uh, the easing model. So it's an assignment of pluses and minuses to a square edge, like on this picture. Uh, but and then uh, what you do, you do uh, percolation on the clusters of easing model. So you play this thing with tossing a coin, uh, not on the whole graph, but on each cluster component. And you should choose a properly biased coin so that you get some critical model. And then uh, there is an easy calculation what you should do. And what you get is that you get a new model where you can forget about plus and minus, you leave only the clusters. And the probability of uh, being two points being in the same cluster in new model is related by linear relation to uh, probability of spins being the same in the easing model. So it's, it's an easy bijection. I don't, uh, so you have to trust me, but oh, I have to otherwise to spend 10 minutes proving it. But uh, essentially, the picture uh, we had so uh, would, would be would boil down to this one that you would have easing model on uh, this blue lattice, then you instead do clusters on the blue lattice. There are dual clusters on dual lattice, and then uh, uh, you, you, you study connection properties here, which, which are related to the, to the spin correlations in the easing model. And it's nice because uh, uh, connection properties, uh, so they are exactly the same by linear equation as the spin correlations in the easing model, but they are more geometric. So if there is a connection between two points, you, for example, can break it. And so it's easier to study certain things. And then, even better yet, it can be reformulated as a loop model. So, at criticality, it turns out that you can just draw the loops which pass between two, two clusters, and uh, you get a picture like this one. And the uh, weight uh, of the configuration is very easy to write, much easier than what we had before. It's just square root of Q to the power number of loops. Uh, and this is for Q state version of uh, Ising model. So, for our version, it's just square root of 2 to the power number of loops. Now, um, it turns out that there is a very easy discrete analytic function in our setting. And the discrete analytic function is just uh, the probability that our domain vo from A to B passes through a given point Z. But you should uh, take it with a sign, so it's not probability, it's rather expectation, and sign depends on the twist of this thing. So it's, it's, uh, you get kind of a spinner there, so if you pass without twisting, the weight is 1. If you pass with 360 degrees twist, the weight is minus 1. So you count winding with a factor 1 half. So basically you have a world where if you rotate by 360 degrees, you go to the negative. And if you rotate again, you go back to your world. So this is sort of a fermionic weight, it's square root of dz form. Uh, and the, the theorem which we proved, uh, so this is, was easier than the spin model, and there is actual event whose probability you calculate in the easing model, in the spin easing model, you have to go to some monodromies and do something in a more complicated space. It turns out that uh, there is this function, which is discrete analytic. It has scaling limit, which is very easy to describe. So it's, uh, you have this domain, you have two marked points. You can map it to a strip. And it's square root of derivative of a map to this strip. And uh, you get such a thing because it's a Riemann-Hilbert boundary value problem, so you get some non-trivial thing. Now, uh, you can say, well, OK, we only have one interface uh, and only one probability of it. What can we do next? And it turns out that from this, you can build the whole uh, 
calculation for this model, and uh, here is the, so I won't show you, so it's an easy probably, uh, combinatorial consideration why it's, uh, why, why, why it's discrete analytic, but here is essentially a proof why knowing this one observable is enough to reconstruct your curve. So what you do, you drive your car, and when you drive your car, you sample this observable. So you know that uh, the observ you know average value of observable, the value of observable at time zero. And then you drive for the first second, and then again you sample it. And the average of samplings after one second is the same as sampling at time zero. So you get a relation that the value of your function uh, here is the expectation of value functions we have drawn for one second. By a function is, is a, map to a, uh, a map to a strip. So if you map half plane to a strip, it's made by logarithm. So you had square root of derivative of map to a strip. So you get a square root of derivative of a logarithm. Uh, and um, so for easing, it should be square root. For other models, it would be other power. So it's just I left, left here arbitrary power. And on the right, it would be the same. But you have first to open up this slit to map to, st to half plane, and then you map by logarithm to a strip, and you open it up by the Lovner map. So you get this relation on the Lovner map that logarithm z prime uh, to the power of sigma one half in our case is expectation of logarithm gt prime to the power of sigma, which might seem uh, a little bit awkward because you have expectation of logarithm of some map you don't know. But if you expand it at infinity and you remember that uh, the coefficient we're after wt is there, you see that you can expand first three terms as a formal power series or even as a non-formal, uh, well, how you, the rigorous power series with estimates, that the first two coefficients, they contain some information about this wt. And if you have two functions which are equal, they have equal coefficients, and the left one has coefficient 1 and then 0, 0, and this has 1 and then this and then that. So expectation of these two guys have to be equal to 0. And if you are a probabilist, you know it's, it's a Levy theorem that if you have a continuous diffusion which, uh, whose first moments are zero and quadratic moments grow like t, it has to be brown in motion. So you get brown in motion as a driving force of the diffusion, not from Schramm's lemma knowing the conformal invariance, but just keeping track of one observable. But that makes perfect sense because you are driving a car and you only after the tilting of the wheel. So if you can measure one thing, for example, distance to the car or probability condition that car passes, hits some tree, then uh, uh, you still infer enough information about this, and then you can also infer other things, because you can, uh, you can uh, run this thing the other way around and calculate different expectations with it. So the Bottom line here is, uh, so, it's, uh, so I had a bottom line for the physics, is that uh, now we have a new tool, a geometric curve uh, introduced by that Schramm. It can be viewed as a random walk on model space, and I did it for a uh, simple, simply connected domain, but you can do it for Riemann surfaces. And we know that if in some model conformal field theory applies, then domain walls have to be a SLEs for some, some value of kappa, some value of how fast you tilt the steering wheel. But also we know that actually proving that one mm, observable has conformally invariant scaling limit is enough and you get converged to SLE. So in most of the observables which so far uh, happened, well maybe with one exception, they were sort of very well known by physics, so there were some homomorphic correlations from conformal field theory. Uh, but uh, what is nice is that sometimes you get new ones uh, and you get shed some new light on what uh, this is new. But also it's nice that uh, when you relate it to stochastic ideas, you can calculate things uh, which were beyond, uh, often beyond the reach of CFT, because the calculation part of CFT is an algebraic object, so it deals with nice algebraic things. Here we don't really care. We have stochastic PDE, and we don't really care whether it's Ising model or some other model. It just changes the coefficient, so it's a bit more integrable, but still it's in the same class. Now uh, I plan to talk about somewhere in New York, and I have exactly like 12 minutes to do that. Uh, so the question is how to describe the full limit. So here, for example, there is FK model where I uh, painted, uh, or rather computer, or rather like computer directed by a graduate student, painted clusters in different colors. 
so how to describe this picture? So there are uh, different uh, things. So one can do spin correlations in the Ising model, and uh, uh, there was uh, some work. Uh, so we, we, we start with Clement Angler sort of rigorous work showing that in a domain, indeed, uh, everything converges to what physicists predicted. And basically, it was finished now by Chilkak Angler and his Europe. One can study a collection of clusters. One can study a collection of loops, which are perimeters of clusters. And there is a big activity by, so there are papers by Lawler, Werner, Sheffield, Hau, and uh, others, and various combinations thereof. And also, what was suggested is to do branching uh, trees of SLEs, which is for these loops. And uh, Kamen Newman did it for percolation. Sheffield suggests some general. Uh, framework for POTS models, and uh, we now, uh, with anti campaign and from Helsinki, uh, uh, so uh, also anti, but not copying, so not to confuse, uh, 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 but uh, we were able to do it uh, for the FK easing model. Now, uh, <coughs> what uh, is this tree and how you get it? So there is this picture where you have a collection of loops, but I just realized that maybe when I was testing it before that you don't, do you see loops here on, on the screen? You sort of see that there are, there are kind of loops going like that. So there is this loop, there is, there is this loop, so you can trace that they actually go like loops. Yeah, maybe it's not very visible, but basically what, 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 uh, what, uh, what you do <laughs> is, is that you erase them, and then you want... <laughs> Uh, to get from point A to point B. So what you do, you start, you draw a loop on which lies the point A. And you follow this loop as long as you don't disconnect itself from B. So uh, as long as it's still possible that it will lead you to B. So here you hit the boundary. And obviously if point B is somewhere, is, is here, you cannot get to B if you continue along this loop inside, inside this thing which you cut. So what you do, you jump to a loop, another loop which passes through the nearby point. And then you explore the next loop, and then uh, you explore the next loop. So each time you jump, uh, when you disconnect yourself from your target, you do one step back, and you just jump to the next loop. Uh, so uh, <coughs> eventually you get to your target point. Uh, so in this case, this is... Uh, and uh, the... This is a branch of a tree because you can draw this trajectory for every point, and then you get a tree of branching branches, uh, to use a tautology. Now, uh, uh, well, here, here, here there are some of the branches drawn, but maybe there is a very important remark that uh, there is a very nice way how these branches are coupled. So the branches, uh, they go, if you aim for two different points, you go exactly the same trajectory as long as they're in the same component. By one, you, once you disconnect it, for example, you hit the boundary, one is on the left, one is on the right, or you surround one of them, then your branch split. One goes to the left part, another to the right. But now they're in two different domains, so they're completely independent. So the branches are they inside until they disconnect the targets, and then they're completely independent. So it's a very, very nice tree, uh, and... Uh, it's, it's if, if we want to allude to previous talks, you, you can think of a worm uh, who is uh, sort of uh, trying to weave this, uh, this picture and uh, which sort of branches at any time when you disconnect the things. So you try to represent your two-dimensional thing as a one-dimensional branching structure. And there is a canonical way to do it. And what is nice, if you think carefully, you can do the other way around. Uh, so you can only not only write from clusters this branching tree, but if you have the branching tree, there is a like, careful definition with four clusters, uh, if you put them properly, which reconstructs uh, from the tree back the clusters. Uh, now, uh, for example, in this picture, if we, we want to, to go from leftmost point to the rightmost point along the boundary, this is the loops we have to use, and this is actually parts of them we have to use. So the branch is, is this thing. Now, uh, you can ask a question, okay, we have these nice branches. Uh, now, can we characterize one branch? And uh, what happens, uh, so I will flash some formulas just to prove that I have them somewhere. Uh, and before that, I say that, uh, yes, you can, and you prove a theorem that uh, uh, actually, as we had before, that one branch converges to CD16 over 3. So now, branches converge to a more complicated version of a CLE, 
So we get a branching version of SLE uh, curves. Uh, and uh, from this, you can deduce convergence of clusters or convergence of loops, and you can uh, do uh, more things. And uh, now we have a thing for branches which run to the boundary because it's uh, technically more difficult, but it's uh, ideologically easier. And now we're writing the path which is technically easier because you, you don't have to deal with fractal boundary you aim inside, but you have to deal with some monodromous round points and spin structures, but we figured it out, so it will be like uh, usually people say in two weeks on the archive, which means sometime in March. Uh, so um, first, uh, what is this SLE generalization? Uh, so I had this SLE Caparon, and so as I said that originally we were drawing a curve in half plane which had trivial models. Half plane has trivial models, any half plane can be mapped to another half plane. But now when I'm drawing this branch, I have another marked point. So I have the target point, we'll say map it to infinity as usual, I have zero from where I draw my curve, but also when I'm on some cycle, I have the, and I traversed half of it, I have the other end point of this cycle. So roughly speaking, if I export some part, it's the rightmost boundary of this half. So I now have a CLE uh, in a plane where there is additional mark of marked point, so I have a diffusion uh, which has another parameter which flows with this diffusion but can influence how the diffusion goes. And this exactly puts us again in the financial mathematics class uh, that you have like whatever stock prices which are interrelated. So you have a system of, of diffusions. Actually here there is one driving diffusion but there is another diffusion which, are, which is driven by it but can influence its position. And of course there are numerous possibilities and there is no easy argument uh, like of Schramm, uh, that uh, there is a nice formula for what makes sense. It turns out, actually, we, uh, like as Kosti as Europe discovered that there's some nice situation you go and don't get nice formula, and it's not really clear how to classify these diffusions when you have large dimensional modular space. But in the case of one additional point, it turns out that the interesting diffusions, the, those are driven by Bessel processes. So for simplicity, uh, if you are not a probabilist, so if you take Brown and motion in d-dimensional space where d can be some fractional number, then absolute value of it is a d-dimensional Bessel process. So it's, uh, it's basically like uh, Brown and motion on half line with certain drift. Uh, and uh, there is, a, so that uh, you call it a silly kappa rho where rho is related to d by this formula. And it turns out that a silly kappa kappa minus six and it's a difficult calculation, well, it's not a difficult calculation, but it was sort of difficult to realize that you can make it. And Lawler, Sean Werner had a beautiful paper that if rho is equal to kappa minus six, you get a silly kappa curve, which looks like a silly kappa, but doesn't see where it is going. So before it disconnects the two target points, you don't know where you go. And particular case, if you put kappa equal uh, six, you get that SLE six zero, which is the same as SLE six because there is zero influence from the marked point, is a local SLE which doesn't see where it's going. And that's why it's a scaling limit of percolation, which is a local version of the Ising model. So what is important for us uh, is that uh, the observable we had for the FK Ising can be generalized to this case. So in our case, uh, we are going along the branch and we are going to visit, uh, for example, we are going the branch which goes from here to here or like from here to there, that doesn't really matter. And then uh, we want to target some edge. So what we do, we cut this edge. So we get uh, four marked points. Uh, so we interface which we currently explore and our target, which is now cut into two. And we can separate it and put away for simplicity. And then we have the four marked points, uh, and apparently the same observable works if we join two of them, any two of them, by a new imaginary edge outside the domain, it will be again only two marked points. And the lattice will be nice inside, but there is one outside edge which we do for consistency. And then you can analyze it apparently, and then uh, it's discrete, uh, the function is discrete analytic. It's more complicated to figure out boundary value problem, but one can do it. And then you can collapse the points back and uh, something blows up, but you have a control over it. And you get some formula. So I, I will just flash the formula. So the formula will go like that for three point and two point function. So it's just very nice uh, algebraic things, combinations of logarithms. And it turns out that the same thing when you go along the branch, you can probe these functions to see how you tilt the steering wheel. 
And it's very easy as long as you go along the branch. You only need to check that when you hop from one cycle to another, this property remains. And then there is, there is some weight which, 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 which tells you so. And now if you do these things, you can again try to reconstruct the diffusion for which uh, it, is, uh, it is the probing function. Uh, and, uh, well, again, I'm just flashing formulas to, to, to tell you that we know them. And in this particular case, it's very interesting because you get two things to be martingales. And uh, one thing essentially tells it you that the driving force is a martingale. And another, it used to be, remember, that the square of uh, driving force grows like t. Now the force power of driving force grows like t. And it's a characterization of a Bessel process. And it's an interesting thing, so I discovered that uh, uh, it used to be well known in the 60s by all the probabilists because a couple of students of Ito and, uh, and others, they wrote PhD theses about it, that for any Ito diffusion, only two moments are enough to characterize it. But in modern literature, you usually use true Quaradan theory where you need all the moments to characterize it. But, well, you, there is another part which works nicer. But apparently there is, a, uh, there is a general principle that if you have a neat diffusion, two moments are enough, but you should carefully choose which ones. And they are given by uh, sort of writing corresponding PD and writing uh, the main eigenfunction and the main adjoint function to this eigenfunction. So in this particular case, it's apparently... Uh, a theorem from an old PGT of 66 that it's a Bessel process if you know these this, 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 this two, two things. And uh, here I think I learned there are some many technical difficulties, but here is uh, basically the bottom line to this uh, paper from, uh, from three weeks ago is that uh, if you want uh, to, to do the geometry of the easing model rather than the Correlations, there is a canonical way to explore these clusters. It's very nice, nice branching tree. Uh, your branches uh, coincide as long as you didn't disconnect the targets, and then they are completely independent. And there is canonical way to get from these three clusters and loops. Uh, and there is a nice couple of branches. And there are absorbers which allow you to reconstruct one branch, and a silica kappa, kappa minus six uh, with nice Bessel diffusions, uh, it uh, originates in two ways. First, you know that your branches have locality properties, they don't see the, where they are going. And that we know that it should be a silly couple, couple minus six. But also, if we haven't had a uh, Schramm-Low and Werner paper, we could plug in this observable and then they get these conditions and look at the thesis of Arbit, who was Arbib, who was student of McKin in 1965, and uh, would reconstruct that this is a Bessel diffusion. Uh, and uh, this kind of does this two-dimensional parameterizes the two-dimensional thing by a branching family of brown and motions, and it also has uh, mm, some associations with some parameterization of Liouville quantum gravity with Scott Sheffield is, is now, and uh, with Jason Miller is now trying, with, is now doing, uh, and I hope we understand more about this geometric structure in the future. Uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for this talk. Are there questions, comments? Please. Uh, these pictures that you have on the, on the top here, how, yes. are those pic how are those pictures actually made? Uh, uh, in a very stupid, uh, well, straightforward way. Uh, so it's the so-called Glauber dynamics. It's uh, fairly slow. So what, what it, but this is actually what happens in nature, more or less. Uh, so your spins, they don't uh, flip uh, all at a time. You can think that they flip one by one. Uh, so you pick up a random spin, and you want to decide to flip it or not to flip it. And this is like in, in real life, there are some thermal fluctuations, so you can just flip, and the higher the temperature, the more likely you to flip. Uh, and uh, there is a, you just compare Boltzmann weights, uh, before flip and after flip, and uh, determine, well, it's, it's easier sort of to see what should be the probability of uh, flipping. And then you, you run it uh, for a long time, and then you get a picture like that. So uh, there are more, uh, you just uh, run till it looks like it should look like, and if you trained, you know when it looks when, like it should look like. So that's a straightforward thing. Uh, there is a more um, 
more ar arcane thing how to sample these pictures like the one, uh, the one below. Uh, uh, and you can also, also, also uh, oh, li like this, this picture. Uh, so, uh, so this is relates to uh, Wilson's work and sampling from the past and Markov chains. So what you can, can do there, so there is an associated uh, kind of uh, height function to this thing. Uh, uh, and uh, what you do is start with two configurations, which one has maximal height function, another minimal. So one, for example, has uh, like loops which go around one side in one parity and another in another parity, well, that, that sort of thing. And then you start flipping so that each time first height function is bigger than the second one, and I if you can do it. And then eventually they will hit each other. And apparently there is a theorem which tells that in this time you exactly sampled the Gibbs measure. So, uh, so it's, it's a very general theorem about Markov chains uh, uh, and uh, the beautiful piece of work. It's, it's kind of, you know, these theorems, it's hard to come up with it, with it but once you know, uh, it's, it's easier to prove. Mm, so it's this work of Prop and Prop and Wilson and Wilson. Uh, so this, this second picture is ma made like that. So the second picture, so the first picture is a good approximation up to my eyesight that what it should look like. And the second is a perfect, perfectly made picture. It's indeed distributed a perfect, perfectly chosen representative. Are there more questions? Other questions? Yeah, but uh, oh. it's, it's not a question, and I was going no, to no. do that anyway. <laughs> I actually, no, I is, is it a, it's not a phrase, it's a proper question. You should say, should we thank the organizers? <laughs> but may I maybe just say a few M Maybe words? I, I you ask a thank question. The, yeah, okay. Uh, you mentioned that in dimension three and four, there are also results in similar directions with critical temperature and uh, results of this kind, but are there also families of uh, canonical limit objects like SLE kappa, is there any chance to find a class which is canonical, unique, or one, two parameter so, family? So, so the, the state uh, in, in two, two words is the following. I mean, if, if you do with few theories, of course there are few theories in any dimension. Now, um, the uh, common understanding 10 years ago was that people did not see any specific reason why it should be conformal field theory in dimension three. So some people thought so, some mm -hmm. didn't, but no one thought about it much. And uh, recently there was, like last two years, there was work of Slava Rychkov, who is, who is at CERN, uh, and uh, assuming that using model is conformally invariant, which only ends inversion, he does some conformal bootstrap, and it it's actually gives you very good approximations is where, where the exponents can be. So basically here you start with some region like that and then making uh, essentially two assumptions that uh, three assumptions, well you make an assumption that it's conformally invariant, you make assumption that there are only like two primary fields, you make an assumption, well, you make assumption that another thing uh, is where it should be. Uh, but uh, I mean what, what's good you see mathematicians always worry about proof so I can exactly see what are the assumptions. So and then, then you basically shrink it to the thing of size 10 to the power of minus 14. So you, you know very well experiments that it perfectly agrees it's much better than the experiments done before, so it means that it's conformally invariant field theory, and uh, it's, it would be interesting first to do it rigorously, but also to see whether you can exactly get exact values of uh, probably transcendental exponents. Now, whether there is a geometric object, obviously one can deduce geometric objects. So good thing about dimension 2 is that uh, uh, do objects to dimension one are also dimension one. So you have a crossing if and only if there is no one dimensional abstraction. Dimension two, you have a crossing if and only if there is no two dimensional abstraction. So uh, it's more difficult to do geometric arguments in dimension two. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say that there is one interesting paper here uh, along this li uh, alliance. So Gadzi Kosma from Israel, he proved that for loop erased and walk, there is a scaling limit which is a fractal curve in dimension three. But he can deduce exponents, it's quite a technical paper. But, well, who knows, maybe eventually. So, questions? So I'd okay, like then, then let's thank the speaker. Yeah. <laughs>
So now maybe I, I want just to say two words, uh, being the last speaker and uh, following the question by Andre. Uh, uh, and uh, well, I mean, first, first, first of all, uh, we we should uh, wish many happy years to the Hausdorff Institute uh, and to mathematics in Bonn, and uh, so not only Hausdorff Institute but the university and Max Planck and everything. So it's uh, uh, let's say hundreds more years and. Uh, all the best. And the second, we should uh, thank the organizers of the center and of this conference for a very nice conference. And thank you very much. Thanks, the organizers. <laughs>